from Ur of the Chaldeans, God called a man named Abraham and promised to make him a nation. A nation of people as numerous as the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky. A nation to be a light unto all nations, a beacon of hope and the apple of God's eye. That nation is Israel. After centuries of dispersion, foreign oppression and exile, on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn as an independent state. That same day, the fledgling Jewish state was attacked by powerful invading armies, but miraculously, Israel prevailed. For 74 years, Israel has not only survived, but thrived in the face of incredible opposition. Time and time again, God kept his promise to Abraham and the Jewish people, and he will continue to do so forever. From one man came 12 tribes who became a nation, a nation which was reborn in a day and now shines as a testament to the unending faithfulness of God. Israel is hope, peace, love, light. Israel lives. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings to each of you who have come to Arlington, Virginia for the 18th annual celebration of Christians United for Israel. We welcome our national and international television audience for this celebration of 75 years of independence for the state of Israel. We are honored by the presence of our distinguished speakers for the evening, Ambassador Nikki Haley of South Carolina and Vice President Mike Pence of Indiana. We welcome the distinguished members of the U.S. Congress. We welcome the members of our executive board as well as the regional and state directors who represent the leadership command force of 10 million plus people the Christians of United for Israel organization have. Will the audience please stand for the singing of the national anthem and both the American anthem and Israel and remain standing for the invocation to be given by Rabbi Abraham Schoenberg of Rodfi Shalom Synagogue of San Antonio, Texas.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for America, the great country we live in. We pray to you to watch over the men and women who stand guard across the world on our, on our behalf tonight. We thank you for the miracle of the state of Israel, the ingathering of the Jewish people to where today, for the first time in over 2,000 years, there are as many Jews living in Israel as there are in the rest of the world. We thank you for the unification of the eternal capital of Israel, Jerusalem, and for the rightful placement of the American embassy there through the hands of some people in this very room tonight. We pray to you for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray to you for the peace of Israel and for the safety of the men and women of the IDF who you use to watch over the Jewish people and Israel. We thank you tonight for the leadership for Pastor and Diana Hagee, for their leadership, their courage, their faith, their friendship, we pray to guidance, you. and their vision of Jerusalem. And we pray to you for their continued leadership. We thank you tonight for Christians united for Israel, for the tens of millions of Christians who support Israel, support the Jewish people, and stand together with me in their love for you, God. We pray to you that one day all Americans will be united for Israel, to stand in support of Israel, because support of Israel is support for America. Support for Israel is support for the values that the forefathers of this great country led it with just down the road from here. We thank you for our guests tonight, Vice President Pence and Ambassador Haley, friends of Israel, and ask your blessings on them to guide them as leaders of this great country. God bless you, God bless the USA, and God bless Israel. We thank you for our guests tonight. May be seated. Vice President Pence and Ambassador Haley, friends of Israel. And ask your blessings. Greetings to all of our friends and to those who are joining us on the national telecast. For this, our 18th annual Christians United for Israel conference. I want to begin by saying that concerning Israel and the Jewish people, you cannot be all things to all people. Are you listening, Washington? You can't say you're a friend to Israel while negotiating with Iran concerning their pr proposed nuclear weapons. You can't say you're against anti-Semitism and refuse to give it a definition. Last week, the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Thomas Nides, advised Prime Minister Netanyahu on how to manage the internal affairs of Israel concerning their Supreme Court. Nides said the Supreme Court overhaul raised questions about Israel's democratic credentials, listen, and the U.S.-Israel bond. The question is, since when do American politicians tell Israel how to manage their internal affairs? <laughs> Israel is a democracy, and they deserve the right of self-determination without U.S. interference. Interference into Israel's political affairs is political anti-Semitism. In combating anti-Semitism, you can't merely make suggestions, but fail to introduce meaningful legislation. Ronald Reagan said it this way, trust but verify. That's being turned on its head with this current administration. Concerning Iran's nuclear dreams, there can be no trust in Iran without absolute verification. America's new strategy in this administration is hope and pay. Uh, pay, not pray, is hope 
and pay. Recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that, quote, the U.S. gave Iraq a sanctions waiver to pay Iran $2.76 billion allegedly for gas and electricity, stating this looks like a bribe to keep Iran at the negotiating table. We call on President Biden to cease and desist nuclear negotiations with Iran. The Bible says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace, day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. Christians united for Israel are not keeping silent. We are speaking out in the defense of Israel and the Jewish people. Give the Lord no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem the praise of all of the earth, Isaiah 62. David writes in Psalms 121, Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Israel has a secret weapon that Iran doesn't know about. The God whose unseen hand guided the stone from David's slingshot. <laughs> that killed Goliath and turned the pages of history is God is the God who watches over Israel. Amen. Tonight and every night until Messiah comes and Jerusalem becomes the praise of all the earth. Jerusalem is the city of God. The Bible says God has placed his name there for an everlasting memorial. It will not be removed by radical Islam. God's name will not be removed from Jerusalem by an act of Russia or China or Iran. Jerusalem is the epicenter of the universe. Jerusalem is the shoreline of eternity. Jerusalem is the eternal and undivided capital of the state of Israel. Jerusalem is the gateway to prosperity. King David commanded all believers everywhere for all time, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. Jerusalem is where Isaiah and Jeremiah pinned the principles of righteousness that became the moral foundations for Western civilization. Jerusalem is the city where Messiah will return over to reign reign over planet earth for a thousand years of perfect peace without a two-state solution, I might add. In that kingdom of perfect peace, the lion will lay down with the lamb. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. For a thousand years, there will be no tears, no suffering, no pain, no war, no moral or political corruption, no fake news, if you can imagine that. <laughs> happy day, happy day, it's on the way. Never underestimate God's love of the Jewish people. Israel is God's firstborn son. That's made very clear in the Bible. Isaiah is, Israel is the only nation in history of the world created by a sovereign act of God. The borders of Israel are recorded in the Bible. Israel is not a political issue. Israel is a Bible issue. <laughs> Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, you're a supporter of Israel. Why? Because if God created the earth, he's the owner of the earth. David says the earth is the Lord's. God very clearly made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants forever that they would have the land for Israel. The covenant is written 20 times in the scripture. Therefore, there is no debate about who owns the Holy Land. It belongs to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 12, 5, and through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
The fact is that God gave every word of the Bible to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are the source of hope and salvation for the nations of the world. The Jewish people gave the world our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the hope of glory and the light of the world. God gave Egypt Joseph, and Joseph's supernatural wisdom gave, made Egypt the most prosperous nation on the earth. The Pharaoh that knew not Joseph underestimated God's love for Israel and the Jewish people. God sent him a message through Moses. He said, tell Pharaoh, this is straight from the scripture, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. Listen to me, Washington. When it comes to Israel, God plays hardball. He still plays hardball. Pharaoh didn't get the message. God sent death, sent the death angel and killed every firstborn child in every home in Egypt that did not have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. It was the first Passover. When God sent 10 plagues, that crushed the economy of, of Egypt forever. Then he drowned Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, turning those warriors into fish food in a matter of minutes. Not one of them survived. Fact, the God of Israel is God Almighty. He calls the stars by name. He holds the seven seas in the palms of his hand. He, he weighs the mountains in a scale and the hills in the balance. The grandeur, the glory, the power of God cannot be really actualized by the minds of men. The God of Israel is God Almighty. There is no God like him and all the power in heaven and earth. And he has the defender and he is the defender of Israel. Psalms 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. David writes, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Listen, behold, he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. That word keepeth is a military term meaning to defend. He who defends Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. There's an all seeing eye constantly watching Israel and it's God almighty. The Bible proves that the Jewish people are the most unique people on the face of the earth. They are a chosen people. They are a covenant people. They are a cherished people. They are the apple of God's eye. The apple of God's eye means the very pupil of God's eye. If you really want to make someone angry, stick your finger in their eye. If you really want to make God angry, put your hand on the Jewish people. He's watching. He's watching. <laughs> Listen to David in 1 Chronicles 17. O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. And who is like your people Israel? Listen to this. And no nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people. Israel and the Jewish people are holy people to the Lord God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. Listen, God is saying this, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. That includes the United States of America. Israel is God's number one nation, period. Amen. Christians who teach that God has broken covenant with Israel are just simply wrong. The Bible says the Lord has made your people your very own people forever. That means right now. That means a million years from now. It be, the land belongs to Israel. God does not break covenant. God makes a promise to Israel concerning the nations of the world. In Genesis 12, God made this promise concerning the Jewish people. I will curse those who curse you. 
And you don't have to be a rocket science in world history to know that every nation that came against Israel, God simply wiped them out. And his policy has not changed. And folks in the Middle East are about to find that out. God does not care what America does with Russia. He could care less what we do with China, but he's watching every move we make toward Israel. The day America stops blessing Israel will be the day God stops blessing America. Look at the pages of history. Where is Babylon the Great? It's gone. Where is Assyria that threatened the destruction of Jerusalem? Their army circled Jerusalem with 185,000 military combatant soldiers who were trained and battle hardened. Hezekiah showed the letter before the Lord, and that night God sent one of his angels and killed every blessed one of them in one night. They woke up, Israel woke up the next morning and saw 185,000 dead men. And Hezekiah said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us bless his name together. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Where is Rome? It's gone. Where's the British Empire? The British Empire that once covered the earth is now reduced to a single island. Where is America? Right now the White House is in a new Iranian courtship concerning Iran's maniacal dream of creating a nuclear bomb to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The Wall Street Journal has stated the White House wants to push the nuclear issue past the 2024 election. That must never happen. We must never allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon, not of any kind, not now, not ever. The uniqueness of Israel is reflected by the rebirth of the Jewish state, May 14, 1948. This historic day fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy that a nation shall be born in a day. I have the newspaper that made that proclamation. This also fulfilled Ezekiel's prophecy where the valley of dry bones came together to become a mighty nation. That nation is Israel, whose genius, whose technology, whose medical inventions, whose military power, and whose national wealth is the envy of the world right now. Simply stated, Israel lives. Israel lives. It's a vibrant, victorious democracy that God has blessed and will continue to bless regardless of what the nations of the world do. Shout the message down the corridors of the corrupt anti-Semitic United Nations building in New York. Israel lives. Shout it down the marble halls of Iran's viciously anti-Semitic capital. Israel lives. Shout it down the halls of the U.S. Congress, where the virus of anti-Semitism is now flourishing. Israel lives. Anti-Semitism is a cancer on the soul of America, but Israel lives. They are protected by the hand of God, and they will forever live. Can I hear a praise in the house? One of America's greatest sins is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is sin, and as sin, it damns the soul. Think about that for just a little bit. The term anti-Semitism was first coined and used in 1879 by William Marr. He was a German anti-Semite who wanted to find a phrase that softened the phrase Jew-hater. Anti-Semitism is a danger to America's national survival. Wake up, America. Anti-Semitism always brings the judgment of God, and America will be no exception. The White House recently released a national strategy to counter anti-Semitism in America. After dozens of pages of one step forward and two steps back, 
This, doc this document could not even define anti-Semitism. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again, and you'll hear it next year. You cannot defeat what you will not define. Anti-Semitism is sin. It is wrong. It is evil. It must not be permitted in our schools, in our universities, in our churches, and most assuredly in our government. We must stop it and stop it now. All that is necessary for evil to prevail in this nation is that good men do nothing. Pastor Eric Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany, and he made this historic statement concerning anti-Semitism. He said, not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. Hitler killed Bonhoeffer for making that statement. It's time for Christians in America to stiffen our spines and vote out of office every anti-Semitic voice in Washington, D.C., regardless of the political party. Let us use our 10 million plus members to vote into office those who have a track record of blessing Israel and the Jewish people. May God bless each of you to be defenders of Zion and a source of comfort to the Jewish people in your city, in your church, and in your nation. Until Messiah comes, let us boldly and aggressively attack and destroy every form of anti-Semitism wherever we find it. Don't be afraid of what people will think of you or say about you. It will not be pleasant if they are anti-Semitic. We are not here to please the anti-Semites or to cooperate with them. We are here to please the Almighty God and live according to the dictates of the Word of God. Let us be defenders of Zion and bring comfort and consolation to the Jewish people now and forever. May God bless America, may God bless Israel, and may God bless each and every one of you.
people really know how to sing. <laughs> it brings me great and enormous pleasure to introduce my friend and one of Israel's strongest and most eloquent and most effective supporters, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. In 2010, she was elected the 116th governor of South Carolina and re-elected in 2014. As South Carolina's chief executive, she was a vocal supporter of Israel and the first governor in the country to sign an anti-BDS legislation. In 2016, Ambassador Haley was nominated as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations where she served as a member of the President Trump's cabinet and on the National Security Council. During Ambassador Haley's time at the UN, the United Nations stood with its allies, repeatedly taking a compelling and principled stand against the chaotic anti-Israel bias in the United Nations. While serving on the UN Security Council, Ambassador Haley proudly issued the first American veto in six years defending, defending the United States of America's sovereign right to move our embassy to Jerusalem, Israel's eternal and undivided capital. It was a distinct honor to travel with the ambassador and her husband to Israel in 2021. Diane and I had the opportunity of seeing the people of Israel spot her on the street and chase her down to thank, thank her for her bold support of the state of Israel while she was in the United Nations. It is my distinct honor to introduce to you Ambassador Nikki Haley.
you so much, and thank you, Pastor Hagee. You know, we've stood side by side in this cause for quite a while now. Pastor Hagee and I have come to Washington together. We've gone to Israel together, and we've prayed together many times. I've learned so much from you and Diana. And while this is a night to honor Israel, this is a year to honor you. Congratulations on your 65 years of preaching the truth and your lifetime of service to Israel and the Lord of Israel. It's so good to be back at Kufi. This is one of my favorite nights of the year. Being here always warms my heart. And you know, this isn't my first time speaking to you. <laughs> but this is the first time I've joined you as a candidate for President of the United States. I'm running for president for so many reasons. To make America strong. To make America proud. And I'm running to restore America to its rightful role in the world. We need a leader who will stand by our friends and stand up to our enemies. And And we must have a president who stands with Israel without apology. Like you, for me, supporting Israel is a matter of faith. But supporting Israel is also a basic test of American leadership. It's not just the right thing. It's the smart thing. Standing with Israel has always been in America's interest. Think about it. Israel shares our values and our vision for peace. She's a nation of faith and a beacon of freedom, a democratic island in a sea of tyranny. And Israel isn't just a friend. We share the same enemies. Virtually everything about Israel justifies America's long-standing support. Amen. When she is strong, we are stronger. When she is safe, we are safer. The leaders of both parties have understood this for 70 years. Republicans and Democrats have stood with Israel. That is until recently. When I say this president has been a disappointment, it's the understatement of the decade. <laughs> From day one, Joe Biden has weakened America and failed to stand by Israel. America's in global retreat. Israel is in greater danger. It doesn't have to be like this. And we can't afford four more years of weakness, or even a year and a half. We need a pro-Israel president. Whoever she may be. We need a leader who not only respects Israel, but also respects her people's right to govern themselves. Joe Biden has attacked that right. I'm sure you remember earlier this year, Israel was debating judicial reforms. The back and forth was intense, but that's what happens in a democracy. You debate, you disagree, you find a way forward. Israel, like America, has the right to decide its own laws. Right. Yeah. 
No other country should dive into its internal debates. A wise president would have known that. But Joe Biden continues to show us what a weak president looks like. He called on Israel's prime minister to, and I quote, walk away from his reforms. He then said the prime minister, quote, cannot continue down this road. And just today, Biden called Netanyahu to complain. He won't let it go. And he's more focused on Israel's domestic debates than the mess he's made here in America. This isn't just wrong. It's dangerous. Joe Biden is risking our friendship with Israel just because he doesn't like Benjamin Netanyahu. And for the record, it took Joe Biden far too long to invite Netanyahu to the United States. He finally made the offer today, but as recently as last week, he refused. And Biden tried to justify it by pointing to the prime minister's coalition partners. That's pretty rich coming from Joe Biden. He has AOC and the squad in his party. And just this week, a leading Democrat called Israel a racist state. The Democratic Party is the definition of extreme. It's time to censure the squad and get anti-Semitism out of America for good. This is not what an ally does. This is not how a friend treats another friend. And it's certainly not how I treated Israel at the United Nations. But this isn't just an insult to Israel. It makes America look small and petty. Imagine if the shoe was on the other foot, if Israel's leader demanded that America stop some judicial reform. We would never tolerate that, and we shouldn't. The conclusion is unmistakable. Joe Biden needs to stay out of Israel's business. And he should end the chaos in America that he's created. We need a leader who builds bridges with our friends, not someone who puts a gulf between us. When I was ambassador, I worked hard to deepen our friendship with Israel. Lord knows it was no small feat. Just before I got to the United Nations, the Obama administration threw Israel under the bus. They abstained on the resolution condemning Israel in front of the entire world. It was shameful. Until then, the U.S. had vetoed the resolution for decades. Staying silent was a failure of moral leadership and a slap in the face to our friend. It was my job to clean up Ob the Obama administration's mess, and I took my duty seriously. When I arrived at the United Nations, we ditched protocol. The U.S. had always met with the same countries in the same order. Israel was nowhere near the top of the list. But I made meeting with Israel a priority. And I told their ambassador I'd never abstain, that I would always have Israel's back, and I was true to my word. I'll send an even stronger message as president. When Joe Biden took office, he ignored our best friend in the Middle East for a whole month. That's how long it took to call, the Israel, to call Israel's leader. Not me. 
As president, I'll call Israel on day one, and I'll make sure we stand clear together all the time. We need a leader that does the right thing, not like President Biden, who recently declared a boycott of Israel. The United States is stopping cooperation with the Israeli science and research projects in Judea and Samaria. The White House says such partnerships are, quote, inconsistent with U.S. foreign policy. No, they're not. But the president's actions are consistent with his and Obama's opposition to Israel. Now, if these were science projects in China, you can be sure Biden would fund them, but not Israel. We shouldn't be canceling cooperation with Israel. We should deepen our ties. And the only thing we should boycott is BDS like I did as governor of South Carolina. We were the first state in the country to do so, and now 37 states have followed in our lead. We need a leader who knows the difference between right and wrong. It's not hard. It's wrong to support a group that routinely calls Israel evil while ignoring real evil. It's wrong to be part of an organization that teaches children to hate Israel. When I was ambassador, the United, ambassador, the United States pulled out of the UN agencies that spew hatred towards the Jewish state and the Jewish people. The UN Human Rights Council does little more than just criticize Israel. For the record, Israel has an excellent human rights record. Meanwhile, the Council ignores countries like China that are actively engaged in genocide. That's why we pulled out of the Human Rights Council. And the same goes for UNRWA. That UN organization uses American money to feed Palestinian hatred of the Jewish state. We said no more. We cut ties with UNRWA. And we pulled out of UNESCO, too, the agency that's supposed to protect the world's heritage. Instead, it denies the Jewish people's history. America should fight.
And I intend to build on that achievement. We'll bring peace to the Middle East once and for all. People said it would never happen. I know because they told me when I was ambassador. They couldn't have been more wrong. The Arab world just needed a little push. And the United States just needed to stand strong. The truth is, we could have gone even further. More countries were close to peace with Israel, but not anymore. The same people who said peace was impossible are back in charge in the Biden administration. Turns out they're the ones who pushed peace out of reach. They're doing it again. Biden has continued to push friendly countries away, and he's pushing them into the arms of our enemies. Today, countries like Saudi Arabia think China and Russia are better partners than the United States. Think about that. They'd rather work with a communist tyrant than the leader of the free world? For the sake of America and for Israel, we need to make Joe Biden a one-term president. We need a leader who advances peace in the Middle East. And of course, we need a leader who will stop Iran from starting a war. How is it that Joe Biden cozies up to Iran while dissing Israel? When I spoke to you last year, the situation with Iran was bad. It's even worse now. Many believe Iran is only months or even weeks away from having the capability to get a nuclear bomb. But the Biden administration has done absolutely nothing. Actually, that's a little unfair. Biden hasn't done nothing. He's given Iran exactly what it wants. The president waived sanctions on Iran's nuclear program. He's lifted sanctions on some of its missile companies. You know, the ones that make the missiles that will carry the nuclear weapons. What's more, Joe Biden is letting Iran skirt sanctions on oil exports. Talk about foolish. We've given away our best bargaining chip. When Iran feels pain, it feels pressure to change. Biden has taken the pressure off. And in its place, he's done nothing but talk. Joe Biden thinks the Ayatollahs are negotiating in good faith. <laughs> they aren't. They never have, and they never will. They hate us, and they hate Israel. Iran is playing Joe Biden like a fiddle, just like it did with Barack Obama. After years of talking, Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon than ever before. But what does the president want to do? You guessed it, he wants to chat some more. The Biden administration has now reopened discussions for a new Iran deal. It's unbelievable. Iran spent the past two years saying it wouldn't budge. Biden showed weakness. Now the Ayatollahs are in a stronger position. And he thinks now they'll do what we want? No chance. They're not going to give up anything, especially their nuclear program. A nuclear deal will only lead to more Iranian oppression and more Iranian terrorism. You want a preview? Just look at what happened in Janine over the past few weeks. That place is a hive of terrorists who do nothing but attack Israel with Iran's support. Israel was right to go into Janine, and Joe Biden is wrong to support creating more Janines. That's exactly what a new Iran deal would do. But the worst part of a new Iran deal is that it guarantees Iran will get a nuclear weapon. Joe Biden should know that. It says a lot that he doesn't. You might have seen that I called for mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75. It's a very basic test that most would pass. But Joe Biden's pursuit of a new Iran deal 
is the best proof yet that he would fail. <laughs> Israel's survival hangs in the balance. The Ayatollahs have promised to destroy Israel many times. We have to take them at their word. Make no mistake, Israel will act before that happens. It will do what it's always done and protect itself from annihilation. It must do that. The Biden administration should support Israel. But if it doesn't, then Israel should do itself and the rest of the world a favor. I hope it doesn't come to that. But if it does, then Israel should end the Iranian nuclear program once and for all. America has a duty to support Israel, but we also have a deeper duty to ourselves. The only way we'll stand with Israel is if we first stand for America. There's a reason we've come to this dangerous place. There's an explanation why our bipartisan consensus on Israel is falling apart. Too many of our fellow citizens have forgotten the principles that bind us together. We've lost trust in each other, and we've lost faith in God. We need to regain our pride and patriotism, and we need to remember God is just getting started with America. I firmly believe we will get through this difficult time. We always have. I've seen it throughout my whole life. You know, a couple weeks ago, I dropped my husband off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. I watched him and 230 soldiers carry their two duffel bags of personal belongings to load a bus to go to a country they've never been, to defend and protect our freedoms. <laughs> they are willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to sacrifice for America here? Thank God for the great men and women in our military. Michael's service reminds me of America's special role. And my time at the United Nations reminded me of our nation's exceptionalism, too. One day stands out among the rest. It was the day I stood on the Simon Boulevard Bridge between Colombia and Venezuela, watching thousands of Venezuelans holding their children, walking for hours in the hot sun to get the one meal they might get that day. They were coming from a land of socialist tyranny, where people were killing zoo animals for food. I stood there for what seemed like hours. The flow of people never stopped. They were fleeing socialism, begging for freedom. 
When I left the bridge, I went to a nearby shelter where the Venezuelans were gathering. You won't be surprised that it was run by a church. I met with some of the refugees, and I hugged them. Then more and more families started to gather around. I didn't get it. Why were they flocking to someone they had never met? Then it hit me. They didn't care who I was. They cared where I was from. In me, they saw America, and in America, they saw hope. It's up to us to renew that hope for our country's sake and for the sake of Israel. I believe with all my heart that we're up for the challenge. And like all of you, I look to the Bible for inspiration. We will fight the good fight. We will keep the faith. And yes, my friends, we will finish and win the race. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Israel. And God bless America. seat and make yourselves comfortable. I've been given the privilege, I'm Mac Ammon by the way, of doing the offering tonight, receiving the offering. That can be a tough assignment, so I'm going to start with a joke. This is, this is actually something I heard from a Jewish friend a couple of weeks ago, but it was this lady cruising along on the highway, going a little too fast, sure enough, police officer stopped her and pulled her over and, uh, uh, you know, went through the usual process of checking her license and whatnot, and then he, he notices she's kind of guarding something behind her leg, and, and he said, what's that, what's that glass you've got behind your leg there? And she said, oh, that's just a glass of water. And he said, well, that looks a lot like wine to me, ma'am. And she looked up at him and said, oh, that Jesus, he did it again. <laughs> Well, 
I consider this assignment to receive the offering a real privilege and an honor, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the process of sharing the word with you about giving tonight, because it is my private opinion, and not private, as shared by a lot of others, that giving isn't what it should be, could be, in either the lives of the giver or in the, you know, the results for the person or organization that's being given to. I think giving has the potential to alter your quality of life more than just about any other single thing you can do. So I'm going to take hmm, maybe six, if I get long-winded, maybe seven minutes to talk to you about the Word and giving, because it's only the Word of God that will produce fruit in your life or the kind of fruit you want to have. The uh, Lord told me a long time ago at the outset of our ministry not to ask for money, just to share the Word of God about giving, because it's the only thing that will produce the right kind of fruit. And so, basically, I want to talk to you about, uh, I guess this would be the right place to start, uh, but in Luke 16, verse 10, and you can refer to these later if you... Uh, don't have the ability to do so now. It's a good study. But the Word says, He that has been unfaithful in that which is least will be unfaithful in much. And so what is the least that's being talked about there? In the next verse, we are told, verse 11, Therefore, if you've been faithful, not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true riches? Unrighteous mammon is the subject. Money isn't inherently evil or good. Uh, it's in how it's used, of course. It's referred to, however, in a way that makes us know God has a way He wants us to use it. And to the extent that we respond to His direction, we are entitled to the true riches. Money's not the true riches. Anybody that's made enough money to, uh, comes to the realization very quickly that money in itself has no capacity to make a person happy, none whatever. Can't heal you, it can't make your relationships healthy, it can't do any of those things. So when it says that there's something else called true riches, we need to understand what that is. This has to do with your quality of life. It is the peace of God that passes all understanding, that will garrison about your hearts and minds. It is the joy of the Lord that is your strength to endure whatever hardship you may come through. It is a contentment and a fulfillment of life that can't come to you through any natural circumstance you may contend with. It is a condition of the human heart. And he actually summarizes it for us in James when he says it's possible for you to experience life perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That doesn't mean you've got everything there is to have in this world. But it means you come to a place where you are experiencing the true riches. The peace of God, the joy of the Lord, the contentment and fulfillment in life. That can be yours. It should be every believer's. But because we are often not faithful in that which is least, which is money, our management of money, we're not entitled. We won't experience the true riches. So what is it that makes uh, us faithful in that which is least? How do we define being faithful in our management of money. Well, of course, who are we accountable to? We're accountable to the Lord. God and His Word are one. So when we discover in His Word what He says about handling our money, then it is that accountability to Him, to the Word of God, uh, that defines our faithfulness. There are things that it says about money in the Word that a lot of people would rather not hear. We're told early on in the Word that it's important that we tithe. 
Tithing is not under the law, predated the law by 400 years, and it fills the New Testament conceptually. So don't go there. But tithing is giving God the first 10% of your increase. And for most of us, that means our income or our salary goes to the Lord. He says it's not even, shouldn't be one of our discretionary kinds of decisions that we can make with other kinds of ways we might use our money. It's not discretionary. Even though we're free moral agents, yeah, we can choose the, the best, we can choose wrongly. We have that freedom. But God says the tithe belongs to Him. It's not something we should feel the liberty to withhold. And we know from the Word that that tithe is to go to the local storehouse or church in the New Testament analogous to the Old Testament storehouse. It is to be the source of general fund income that enables that house of God to operate. That's where it should go. And it should be with consistency. The second thing he tells us about money management is that we're to give beyond the tithe. Those are called offerings. And in the New Testament, we see them referred to often in terms of sowing, giving to support the preaching of the gospel. And that's the key for the second category of money management. Once you've tithed, now you can give offerings. If you haven't tithed, you can't give an offering until 10% of your income has gone to God because it's not even yours. So I sometimes hear people say, well, I'm giving the Lord offerings, I'm not tithing yet. Well, you're not doing much of anything, friend, because you're missing what the Word of God tells us. We're to give offerings. To whom do we give offerings? He said, says in the Word, primarily, and listen to me, this will be a benefit to you if you pay attention. Basically, he says that we're to give offerings to those who have taught us in the Word. Now, this isn't uh, localized simply to the church that you may attend. Anybody that teaches you and you receive revelation from, the Lord says you should support the preaching of the gospel where you're taught. If you're taught on, uh, by another ministry that you happen to listen to, you should send them an offering. Give offerings beyond the tithe. The third thing we're told is that we're to give to the poor. This is giving to people that there's no possibility that they could ever repay you for your generosity. There's no way to gain political leverage in any arena of life's endeavors. It's somebody that simply needs some financial help. And he'll bring these people across your path with regularity. And just as Jesus did often with his giving, use it as a hook in the jaw to bring them to a higher truth that will elevate them out of poverty permanently. But you'll have these occasions these opportunities throughout your life. Now here's the upshot for tonight. There's a, another way that the Lord tells us we are to manage our money that doesn't get talked a lot about and that, uh, you know, probably isn't real popular in some arenas. Uh, but I, wanna, uh, I want to read to you a verse of Scripture from Romans 15, verse 27. And this is from the New International Version, which, uh, which I like. And uh, let me see if I can find it here. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings. Now, how would that occur? How would a Gentile, somebody who doesn't have a covenant with God, share in the Jews' spiritual blessings? This is one of the reasons the Bible talks about salvation is of the Jews. All of this started with their, under their covenant with God and under their opportunity to live in God's blessing. When the Lord brought us the new covenant and opened to 
more than the Jewish or the seed of Abraham through Isaac, open to the Gentile world the opportunity to experience his blessing, we were, were partaking at that point. You can say we got saved, we became a Christian, we are born again, a lot of different terminology. But when that occurs, uh, you know, we've shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings. And then it goes on to say in verse 27, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessing. Wow. We owe it. This isn't a, 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 a casual suggestion about how we can manage our money. We actually owe it. And I like even better the, the rendering of this passage in the Passion Translation. It reads about halfway through the uh, 27th verse. Since the ethnic multitudes have shared in the spiritual wealth of the Jewish people, it is only right that the non-Jewish people share their material wealth with them. Now, just in case there's the slightest possibility of your thinking, your flesh saying, your carnal nature suggesting, what's in this for me? Your quality of life. Because if we're faithful, if we are faithful to do what God says we should do with our money, yes, it's been taught a lot that we should tithe. Yes, it's been taught a lot that we should give offerings. And we all know that we should give to the poor. But it hasn't been taught enough with enough emphasis that we should be financially supporting not just the state of Israel, but the Jewish people when we have opportunity to do so. And I can't think of any better opportunity than to do it through Christians United for Israel. Amen. Amen. So, so my exhortation to you would be simply, if you want a little more peace of God in your life, a little more joy of the Lord, a little more fulfillment and contentment in life, the true riches, then we need to begin by being faithful in that which is least, which is finances. So I would like you to take the offering envelopes that you find uh, on the seats in front of you, perhaps. If you need an envelope, uh, then raise your hand and hopefully an usher can get you one. But there should be one at your seat or under your seat, whatever the case may be. And as you're preparing your offering, I suggest you just say to the Lord, if your word is really true, then I'd like to experience a measure of that peace and joy in spite of whatever circumstance I'm facing, in spite of the difficulties. I want to be contented with my life. Then I believe he'll show it to you. He'll manifest a measure of that to you, and he'll confirm his word in your life. The ushers are ready to receive the offering tonight. Let's... Uh, Let's pray first, and then we'll receive that offering. Heavenly Father, we so thank you for the opportunity to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We understand that there'll be resistance from our flesh, our carnal nature, that says, what about me? Well, this is a way to answer that spiritually, Lord. You said that if we want to experience the true riches, to do it your way. That's what we're doing tonight. We thank you that as we give liberally, generously, and without restraint, we can experience the fullness of your promise in our life. We dedicate these gifts and offerings tonight to the service of Christians United for Israel in supporting the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. It's in the mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I am pleased to introduce a longtime CFI friend and staunch defender of Israel, Vice President Michael R. Pence. <laughs> Mr. Pence served as the 48th Vice President of the United States. He previously served as the Governor of Indiana, and to becoming Governor, Mr. Pence served for over a decade in the U.S. House of Representatives. Throughout his career in public service, Vice President Pence has been a stalwart defender of Israel and a true friend of Christians United for Israel. As a congressman, he was a leading defender of the Jewish state and spoke at one of the first CUFI Washington summits. As governor, he enhanced Indiana's relations with Israel and traveled to the Holy Land on a CUFI-sponsored trip. We sent him to Israel for the first time. While in office as vice president, he was a leading voice in the White House in support of Israel, and we were, as we are this evening, honored to hear from the vice president during our annual visit to Washington. It is now my distinct honor to present to Vice President Pence the Defender of Israel Award given in recognition of his faithful and enduring service to Israel and the Jewish people. Will you please make welcome the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. Well, thank you all for that warm welcome and hello and welcome to Washington, D.C. to Christians United for Israel. I want to thank Pastor Hagee for two introductions. <laughs> More than that. Pastor Hagee, I know I speak for everyone in this room. When I thank you for all you've done, your ministry for Jesus Christ, but as we gather here today, would you all just join me in thanking Pastor Hagee for all he has done to strengthen America's relationship with Israel. I'm deeply uh, humbled to receive the Defender of Israel Award. And I promise you, as Karen and I begin on a new chapter in our lives, wherever the Lord leads my family in the months and years ahead, I will always be a defender of our most cherished ally. And if I have anything to say about it, if the world knows nothing else, the world will know this. America stands with Israel. To the board members of CUFI, to everyone that's gathered here today, thank you for your generosity. To this effort, this ministry, thank you for your invitation and for your leadership and all that you've done to build a brighter future for the United States and our most cherished ally. And I want to congratulate all of you. CUFI is an extraordinary organization. The last time I spoke here in 2019, you had just six million members. <laughs> around the country. Today, 10 million members of Christians United for Israel. You know, uh, that, that can only be explained in one biblical way. The Bible tells us every good tree bears good fruit. And I truly do believe that the hand of providence is on the side of this extraordinary ministry. So give yourselves a round of applause for all you've done here at Kufi, standing up in defense of Israel.
and the Jewish people. I'm grateful for this recognition, but some of you that know me well know that I'm hardly new to this cause. When I was first elected to Congress more than 20 years ago, every time I heard the issue of Israel come to the floor of the Congress, I would hurry to the floor and offer a speech. In fact, some of the older members of Congress, including some Democrat members of the Jewish community, would sometimes come up to me and uh, be curious about it. They'd say, that's quite a speech on Israel. I'd say, well, thank you. And they'd say, uh, big Jewish community out there in rural Indiana? <laughs> I'd say, well, I've got Jewish constituents, but not a large community. And then they'd always say to me, what's your mother's maiden name? <laughs> and I would always tell them, look, my love for Israel springs from the heart of a heartland boy who can tell you firsthand what all of you in Kufi already know is that love for Israel echoes from every little buckboard church beside every cornfield all across America. Like all of you, I'm one of the millions of Americans who has grown in my faith to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I stand for Israel not just because she's the strongest democracy in the wider Middle East, not just because she's our most important ally, but I stand with Israel and always will because I believe with all my heart that he will bless those who bless her. You know, last year I had the honor of visiting Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Karen and I actually traveled to Hebron, the oldest Jewish community in the world, where Abraham and Jacob made their home some 4,000 years ago. It's amazing to know that the Jewish people are once again living and working and worshiping on the same land that their ancestors owned thousands of years ago, and that's why I'm so proud that the Trump-Pence administration declared that the communities of Judea and Samaria are not inconsistent with international law. And I want to thank each one of you. I want to thank you for the privilege of serving as your vice president. It was the greatest honor of my life. And it was a special honor to be a part of the most pro-Israel administration in American history. You know, our administration took steps that truly were historic. We ensured that Israel would always have the resources and the strength to defend herself by herself. From our first day in office, we worked to strengthen the ties that bind the people of our nations together. Under the Trump-Pence administration, we made history, as members of CUFI know better than most. We passed the Taylor Force Act that shut down funding for the Palestinian Authority until they stopped paying stipends to the families of terrorists. And CUFI made that possible. We acknowledged Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. We removed the United States from the UN Human Rights Council for its blatant anti-Israel bias. And we shut down the PLO office here in Washington, D.C. And established a center for counterterrorism in the Middle East. We issued the strongest executive order ever to fight anti-Semitism, and we banned taxpayer dollars from any institution of higher education that trafficked in anti-Semitic hate. And we withdrew from the disastrous Iranian nuclear deal and made it clear to the world that America will never allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. And of course, after years of broken promises, stretching across four previous administrations, I couldn't have been more proud 
to stand beside the President of the United States in the diplomatic room just before Christmas when he signed our decision to move the American Embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the State of Israel. You know, today I know we're all thinking of a great friend of America, a great friend of the American people, and a champion of freedom. And our hearts are going out today, as well as our prayers, to the longest-serving prime minister in the history of Israel. Join me in thanking and praying for a full recovery for our friend, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> You know, it's humbling for me to be able to refer to, the, to a former, or to, as a former vice president, to a head of state, as a friend, but Bibi Netanyahu is my friend. I've made memories with him over the years, and I, I cherish his leadership and his courage in leading the people of Israel. In fact, one of my favorite memories was uh, the day just a few years after we dedicated that new American embassy in Jerusalem. The Prime Minister came to the Embassy to meet with me. It was his first visit there. But standing outside the door, we posed for the obligatory picture by the cornerstone that had been laid. And it was there that I saw firsthand that the name of our great ambassador, David Friedman, appeared. The name of President Donald Trump appeared. And there between them, at the ambassador's direction, appeared the name of your Vice President. It was one of the greatest honors in my life. I mean, to think that we have the privilege of my family's name appearing on a cornerstone of a building that symbolizes the unbreakable friendship between the United States and Israel is something that I'll cherish forever. And every step of the way, we stood with Israel with your support and with your prayers. And as we did it, the naysayers derided our approach to American-Israeli relations, didn't they? They issued dire warnings that blood would soon flow in the streets of Israeli cities. And as usual, they were wrong. We proved just how wrong they were. When in the fall of 2020, standing on the south lawn of the White House, the leaders of Bahrain, the UAE, Israel, and the United States stood shoulder to shoulder and signed the most significant breakthrough for peace in decades. The Abraham Accords were achieved. I mean, we demonstrated that an unambiguous stand with Israel actually makes peace more possible not less possible. But how times have changed. After all that historic progress, President Joe Biden has weakened America at home and abroad. And the Biden administration has all but abandoned our unambiguous and unqualified support for Israel. I mean, think about it. Funding has been restored to the Palestinian Authority. Iranian nuclear talks have been reopened in fact, this administration has even worked with Russia as an interlocutor between Iran and the United States. A consulate to the Palestinian people has been opened in Jerusalem, an outrageous and unlawful step that undercuts Jerusalem's status as Israel's unified capital. You know, after the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, America's standing in the world has diminished. I take no joy in saying it, but the enemies of freedom have been emboldened. It's no coincidence to me that Russia waited until the Biden administration to launch its unprovoked and heartless invasion in Ukraine, or that North Korea has resumed to firing missiles, or that Iran is once again spreading terror abroad while mercilessly slaughtering protesters in their streets. All those things are happening now because history teaches. Weakness arouses evil. 
but peace comes through strength. And we need to return to American strength. I mean, it's incomprehensible to me that public reports have confirmed that the Biden administration is actually continuing to pursue negotiations for what would be an even worse nuclear deal with Iran. In fact, the Biden administration has even admitted that under a restored nuclear deal, Iran would be capable of amassing enough nuclear fuel for a bomb in less than one year, even faster than what was allowed under the previous deal. These actions are foolish and they're reckless. Appeasement has never worked and it never will. A renewed nuclear deal won't lead to peace and stability. It will lead to more terrorism, death, and destruction. A renewed deal won't block Iran's path to a nuclear bomb. It will pave it in gold. So today, I call upon President Joe Biden and his administration to stand with our cherished ally, stand up to state-sponsored terrorism, and cease and desist all nuclear negotiations with the mullahs in Tehran immediately. But supporting Israel requires more than just strength on the world stage. It requires strong action and clarity here at home. You know, it's truly shameful to see so many left-wing Democrats spending time spewing venom and vitriol at our most cherished ally. Just last week, Congresswoman Neilan Omar, who lost her seat on the International Relations Committee, for using anti-Semitic tropes, announced that she would boycott Israeli President Isaac Herzog's upcoming address to Congress. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, recently claimed, quote, Israel is a racist state. And not to be outdone, earlier today, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib doubled down on the anti-Semitic remarks of her peers by accusing the Israeli government of, quote, committing the crime of apartheid, a racist system of oppression. Let me be clear on this. The words by these Congresswomen are a disgrace, and they are beneath the dignity of the relationship between American and Israel and President Biden and every Democrat member of Congress should denounce them and denounce them today. There is no place for anti-Semitism in America or in the American Congress. As a member of Congress, it was my great privilege, along with the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in Congress, the late Tom Lantos, to serve as the first co-chair of the Anti-Semitism Caucus in the House of Representatives. And let me take this moment to commend Speaker Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans, who in the face of these disgraceful comments will tomorrow bring a resolution to the floor of the House of Representatives saying America stands with Israel. Thank you, Speaker McCarthy. We must also make sure that we stand against anti-Semitism in all of its forms. You know, when I was governor of Indiana, I became one of the first governors in America to stand up against the racist BDS movement. Ambassador Ron Dermer actually flew to Indianapolis for our signing. He told me that Indiana had the strongest anti-BDS legislation in the country. The truth is, in 2025, I believe the next president of the United States should fight for and sign 
national legislation permanently banning anti-Semitic BDS laws in the United States of America. You know, you're gathered here tonight, and at the end of a long day, being gracious to your last speaker. Because <laughs> you understand. Providence has entrusted the United States with a special responsibility. The guardian of our liberty. And I believe with all my heart of hearts, the guardian of Israel. We will never forsake our trust to the American people. And Israel is a friend we will never forsake. So help us God. America stands with Israel today at a critical moment in the life of our relationship. We stand with Israel for the same reason the American people have always stood with Israel. We stand with Israel because her cause is our cause. Her values are our values. We stand with Israel because we believe in right over wrong and good over evil. And we stand with Israel because Israel's very existence is proof that the promises of God are true. How probable is it that a man named Abraham, a man who ruled no empire, commanded no army, performed no miracles, delivered no prophecy, how probable is it that he should become one of the most influential people in the history of the world and the progenitor of our own Christian faith? How probable is it that his descendants, a group that comprises one-fifth of one percent of mankind, would outlive and outshine the world's greatest empires? Assyria has fallen. Rome is no more. The walls of Babylon have been reclaimed by the sands of time. Yet the Jewish people remain strong and proud and free and home. How likely is it that after 2,000 years of exile, after millennia of being scattered to the four corners of the earth, after centuries of relentless persecution and hardship. And just four years after walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that the Jewish people would return to that ancestral home to create a new, free, prosperous, and proud state of Israel. God is good. As Winston Churchill said, he must indeed have a blind soul that cannot see that some great purpose is being worked out here below, of which we have the honor to be faithful servants. So I come here tonight not to accept an award, but to express my gratitude to you. As I can attest through my years in the Congress, my years as a governor, my years as your vice president, that it was the men and women of Kufi your activism, and your prayers. It was your being faithful servants, strengthening the relationship between America and Israel that's made all the difference. You know, I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. And I promise you. I promise you that wherever the Lord leads our little family in the days ahead, I'll always do my part to be a faithful servant to the American people. And I will always do my part to ensure that America stands with Israel. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Israel. And God bless America.
If you would please stand or remain standing, we'll receive our benediction and be dismissed. I want to commend you on your courage and your endurance through this wonderful day. I want to wish you quick rest because tomorrow is going to be a very important day. But I also believe that what we've done here is a day that has been blessed of God, and I want to give him thanks for it. Father, I thank you. Your promises are yes, and they are amen. Your word is forever true. Your faithfulness endures from generation. And what we have done today, we have done for your cause and based upon your truth. Now, those who have the courage to take a stand, I ask that everything that they do, you would increase and multiply. Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious unto them and give them your peace. In that mighty name that is above every name, we say amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.